Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Awesome. So, thank you again for coming. And once again, we have a nice turnout. It's been very interesting. The first one, for those of you who are there, remember we hit our Zoom account limit by the time we started at 1,000. Last week we had 350 something, and then today, well, probably somewhere between 160 and 200 by the looks of it. So it's interesting. And what excites me today is the ones that are still here are the ones that are keen and obviously desire to do something. So you can look forward today to me sharing a bit more openly than the previous kind of times on a few things. So well done for hanging out and sticking through it. So, but like anything, you've got to kind of work for stuff. That's my attitude. And yep, well done for coming and sticking in there. So let's have some fun, everyone. So now we're going into our part two. So let's get on with it. So just to be very clear, I'm not a lawyer. I've mentioned this before. I'm about empowering you and it's not legal advice. And I'm specifically not uh, permitted to give legal advice. So, and I'm getting some lovely comments and thank you everyone about dedication. And look, I think really it's simple. All of us uh, um, have got our role to play. If we're going to see anything done about the pretty horrendous state of our country right now, which is, <laughs> yes, as, as grim as we've probably seen it in our lifetime, no doubt. So, it's everyone's going to do their part as I see it. So well done to everyone here by doing your part and learning and hopefully from here, being able to take some action and contributing something to the bigger picture, um, no matter how small it is. And that's really the main thing, you know, so just doing what you can. So housekeeping, um, just giving it some good focus, like I said, it's where you'll get the best out of this. So Typing questions in the chat, by all means, just one thing I want to clarify very clearly with the questions, I will keep on going, we will have a, a, a question time at the end. Occasionally, I will see a question that really relates to what's happening, and I will answer it. But if you put questions throughout the webinar, which don't get answered, I won't see them by the time the um, Q&A time comes. So you'll just have to make sure you remember to put it in there. So that's the thing there. Um, yeah, as you all know, I just don't really um, cope well with toxic behavior. So I don't even warn people, I just get rid of them. It's just easier. So to me, there's plenty of good people. I don't know about all of you, but one of my pet hates is when I'm on Facebook groups or webinars, and you can just tell some people are being dicks and everyone can see it. And then the person thinks you've got this obligation to be nice. And I don't feel that obligation, you know, so. I think it benefits everyone here who's sincere, who's appreciative and keen to learn to not have these one or two or three or four people who are just unappreciative and saying things like, oh, I'm not learning anything. If you're not learning anything, you can just jump off and go somewhere else. And there's plenty of others out there where you can learn what you're looking for. And I, I in saying that, I just acknowledge what I'm doing is not for everyone. You know, it's going to be for some people will resonate. Some will go, nah, this guy's not really telling us much what we're looking for and so be it. That's okay, I understand. So take handwritten notes, recording some of it, and I say some of it because today I'll be, there'll be some parts I'll be shutting it off today and you'll see why when I do it. Two hour maximum, um, I'm hoping to do a bit less today and no selling. So again, not selling. So what we'll be covering today, a um, bit of revision from last week, the state of emergency, what it actually means, um, Mandates versus legislation we'll be covering. Um, jabs, kind of masks and other topics. Um, and then we've also got, um, sorry, just one thing I just realized that we're missing from this. So I'm just gonna be picking up the slide so it more accurately portrays what we're doing. So revision is the Commonwealth constitution. Um, we've got, um, Parliament. So this is revising last week, a quick look over. Today we're going to go a bit more specific on some stuff. So jabs, masks, lockdown, other topics, state of emergency, what it actually means, mandates versus legislation. These, these little things here 
will make all the difference. You're probably making some sense as to why these maniacs have just turned up and are able to do the kind of stuff they're doing. So hopefully by the end of two, three, and four, you will see where you're at, where we're at, and what's really going on. Um, overarching human right, I'm going to be discussing as well, because even though, as you're going to see today, we've got a real problem, I think, in terms of the current law about addressing this, I do actually believe that there is an overarching right which can, you know, um, basically be looked at or whatever else that we that can be looked at and understanding all of this. So I mentioned last week a bit about me. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'd imagine most of you have probably come to the other webinars. But I've been doing this for quite a while now. Um, over 30 years experience, you're probably thinking, wow, how can you have over 30 years and look so young and, you know, sexy and like you're only 25 years? Look, I just have to say that, you know, every now and again, I've got to boost my ego a bit. Um, and background, qualified lawyer, accountant, financial planner, had my own firm. Those who get to know me will know I've got a pretty eccentric sense of humour. So you'll see that come through. I've run a ran a radically awakened physical church where we even had guys from underground movement come and teach stuff um about common law back 20 years ago and you can imagine how that was a bit controversial at the time um we've been involved in off the grid movements had high success in my own life in these kind of areas and fines and not getting my kids involved and stuff like that over the years so i've had a fair bit to do with the law and hence i'm happy to share what i've got so that's just that Okay, so really I'm just gonna brush over last week quickly. So we're fast heading into socialism and a civilization collapse. I think that goes without saying. And to say we need a spiritual awakening is an understatement. And without that, I think one of the things is you'll learn in the next week or two, when we do the revolutions and history of awakenings, people often give the French Revolution as an example of what the people are gonna do without realizing the French Revolution was a complete disaster. Um, and back in the 1700s. And the revolutions that have worked have always combined the spiritual and the political. The two have gone hand in hand. So there's been a bit of a consciousness, energetic, heart, soul, moral awakening of the people, which has basically caused the society's standards of integrity to go up, which then spills over into the political arena. When you're basically living in a world of a bunch of swindlers who are more about net worth than they are about anything else, as we lived in Australia, unfortunately, you tend to attract who you are. So when you, by and large, got an extremely, what I call greedy, money-centered, very kind of self-centered generation as we've lived in, you tend to attract that in your government. So hence why the spiritual awakening sorts that side out um, and the political awakening then follows on from that as the people become stronger in their heart and soul and say, we're not gonna put up with this nonsense for one second. And People who are previously cowards become heroes. People start to step up and be so passionate, they're willing to die for their faith. They're willing to die for what they believe. And all the great revolutions and awakenings you've heard about have usually had people like that involved somewhere at some point. So political action is definitely required, but to have that, you've got to have education and wisdom as well, because without wisdom, you'll get caught up with every internet conspiracy theory, You'll get caught up with people who've got no idea what they're doing, who will make up just about any silly nonsense they can to help them overcome their fear. And keep in mind that one thing I learned in the underground movement was that we've just literally got like um, so much deliberate misinformation gets put out there. So I don't know if you all know that, but they actually have people who actually work for groups that are doing the kind of laws they're doing to deliberately put this information out to mislead people. So that's why you've really got to make sure you learn correctly and know how to disseminate truth from falsehood. So playing your part, the main thing to understand is you learn this stuff. Not everyone has to go out and become a big political crusader. Not everyone has to go out and run around and become some spiritual process guy or girl or whatever else. You've just got to find your, 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 um, your little role and the little way you can give back in business, it could be standing up in your business in some form. If it's in, um, if you're basically a church leader, especially to stand up and start saying, no, we're not gonna basically play ball with this and start to speak out against it, no matter what the cost. Um, if you've just got a small little business, you might just decide to 
find a way to help other businesses. Um, if you're a parent in a school, you might decide to become a voice, whatever you actually get led to do. The main thing is get the knowledge and to do that. So everyone's got their part to play, as I call it, in the army of God, um, however small it may be. So last week we covered this, the legal system in Australia. So the main thing we went through was how the British Empire came to Australia and the laws of conquest automatically applied their laws to landers, um, to the lands they conquered. Australia adopted English law into their colonies, now known as the states. Um, although Aboriginals were displaced and their laws not recognised, in time, in 1995, they were recognised, um, albeit to a lesser degree, but at least they got recognised. So, history of our legal system is that. I incorrectly said last week, not incorrectly, but I think misleadingly talked about the way English law related to Australian law. I actually realised that afterwards, in a double check, I spoke with my father, who's a constitutional professor, went into in depth, and basically, the correct way how it works is this. Although all English law was automatically adopted at Federation, and since that time, legislation has overridden much of it. And it's very important to realise, as I shared last week, we don't have a Bill of Rights in Australia. Now, we just don't. We haven't ever really had that. We've got segments of the Bill of Rights arguably still applying, um, and the Magna Carta in Australia, but we don't really have a Bill of Rights, so to speak. So this is one of the big omissions in Australia, and it's because of our history and the way we were formed. The fact that we really were just a slave colony of England, and although we've become, we've grown up and become relatively independent, we haven't totally, you know, cut the shoestrings from our parents, so to speak, as you'll see. So we're still attached to England in a way. So by and large, we're little bits of everything. We, we, we're a country that doesn't really have its own identity. So my semi-joke, but more serious, is that I can see Australia is just doing exactly what it was doing back 200 years ago. We've gone back to being a um, convict colony where they've locked everyone in, no one can travel, and the convicts have to do what their masters tell them. So by and large, we're just not seeing... Um, yeah, so Australia, by and large, it's a real opportunity, as I see, for us to awaken and find our own identity and lead the way in world affairs. I can remember in Gallipoli and various wars, when you go back with the Anzacs, they're legendary Australia for stepping up and, and, and coming out from nowhere and bringing off the impossible victory that no one expected of us. So I honestly do believe in Australia, we're gonna be a surprise packet or we can be. Um, even though we seem to be the most disempowered nation in the world, I just about at the moment with everything, I actually reckon that we could be the surprise packet here. Because I highly doubt the kind of stuff I'm doing here and getting up and speaking on the spiritual awakening as well as legal awakening would get very far in many other places in the world, except possibly um, US. So it's just, we definitely have a unique opportunity. So the life, liberty, property of the common law, I mentioned it's from the Holy Bible, our foundations. And this was how Australia formed. We went into depth on that last week. But the colonies were independent before 1901. Federation occurred. And the key that I mentioned was to understand how the states and Commonwealth came together. So there's so much misinformation where people seem to think that the Commonwealth always overrides the state, which is far from the truth. In fact, when Federation was done in 1900 odd, the states were like, there's no way we want to give up our power to the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth were like, well, we don't want to be just a dead duck entity either. And Britain were like, and we don't want to lose full control of our little colony either. So there was three different interests to balance out. And the result was the states maintained their powers and autonomy subject to handing over certain powers to the Commonwealth and in turn still remaining under England, which really is still the same today, 120 years later. Um, as a little bit of a side, I shared how WA tried to succeed in 1933. Um, and even though they passed a referendum, the Commonwealth basically wouldn't support it. And then the UK Parliament also refused to support it. So I mentioned here that no one really knows, and constitutional lawyers are still arguing this to this day, that we are still, some have said we're independent already. The Australia Act was a bit of a mess. Um, my view is, although we are kind of independent, 
you can't deny the fact that our constitution still makes us a monarchy under England. We, you just can't deny that. And the Whitlam dismissal in 75, which I went into last week, showed that. So the constitutions, as I mentioned, came in to protect the rights of the people and give certain freedoms, and they can only be suspended by mutual contract or agreement. So like you join the military, navy, business, or state of emergency. That's why today I will be sharing a bit more on the state of emergency to really understand this. This is a real problem because it really does suspend a lot of people's rights that so per se. So we have a democracy or system of responsible government. I went through the constitution last week and went through and explained how you notice the words, the blessing of almighty God, which are just wonderful words and really summarize everything about our country, which is so great in that we have actually got that like the blessings of almighty God and countries that have done that for whatever reason, just seem to prosper and seem to do really, 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 really well. So we went through the government diagram, which showed in this thing here. So you've got this executive legislature and judiciary, lower house and Senate. I'll just come back actually to that in a minute. Um, section one basically creates the parliament, which is here. And you've got the executive, which I mentioned in very simple terms is ScoMo and his cabinet. They're the people who run the country day to day. This is the people we vote in to make the laws. So these guys make the laws, these ones administer the laws, and these ones interpret the laws and basically say that if these two can't agree. So that's the basic aim of that. So when the people, or when there's a dispute between how the laws work between them and them, like this group are going ahead and administering the laws from this group in a certain way, and the people or the parliament don't like what this group are doing here, and say, we think ScoMo's overstepped his authority, like Nathan Buckley, of GMB lawyers is saying, we think that ScoMo's um, going way too far with saying that, you know, aged care can be mandated. So they then go to judiciary, which is like the high court and say, we want you to hold that basically ScoMo and his group can't do this kind of crap anymore. So that's the best way to think of how our government actually works in practice and in the real world. So when you understand that, so executive administers, legislative makes it, judiciary interprets the laws. So for example, who's responsible for this state of emergency? The group in number two here, they're responsible. They're the ones who've passed this law. They're the ones who've gone right outside their constitutional scope, which is to represent the people. And these are the ones here who then basically administer that state of emergency, but they can't do jack crap unless this group give them the authority. So this is Beat Your King of Australia. Um, and I say that facetiously, but if you actually read the constitution, this guy represents the queen, David Hurley. So David Hurley is a governor general. He represents the queen and um, is effectively the king of Australia. And even though in the real life, he just rubber stamps whatever the parliament tells him to do, which I explain was a fallout from England in the 1600s where parliament broke away from the, from the monarchy. Hence why Harry, um, William, Prince William, um, Charles and all that had got no power in England whatsoever. They're just like a, a figurehead. This guy's the same. He's just a figurehead to the real rulers of Australia. So the lower house, which is the parliament, which is the one that makes the laws. So this is the one that governs. So ScoMo, as I mentioned, governs Australia because his party in league with another group called the Nationals controlled 76 of the 151 um, votes or members. Now, so that means that he can pass laws. So I mentioned here occasionally there's a hung parliament like 2010 where no one actually had government, neither Labour nor Liberal nor anyone. So they had to end up working with independents. So generally this is how the lower house works. So the next election coming up in 2022, it's gonna be interesting to see if um, a party gets 76 members, if the Liberals or Labour, a beautiful case scenario would be if neither party rule government and some of the part minor parties like the more like the Rod Cullerton party or others could get enough people in there 
because then the government would have no choice but to listen to the people more than they are now. The, 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 the parliament was never meant, and this is something to understand, it was never meant to have parties. If you read the constitution, the whole idea of having parliamentarians was to have people to represent the electorate. So let's just say where I live, you might have a few hundred thousand people living here, and we have a representative for our district. And then another one has a representative for their district. And then someone else has a representative for a district. And um, they then represent the unique districts, um, whatever. Whereas you've basically got politicians who join parties who've hijacked the system. So my personal view is that the answer would be very, very good if we had a lot more of the smaller parties getting seats and the lower house not, for example, having as much control of one party. That would get back to the original intention. So this is how it works right now. And if you want to know why does New South Wales have three times as much as WA, it's because it's got three times as many people. So the idea is that um, this house goes proportionately to how big the state is. Now, by contrast, this, is, this group doesn't govern, but let's say that ScoMo and his group pass some laws around vaccines, okay? But he can't get these laws um, through unless this group approves them. So it's got to actually go through this. And if you had a very strong Senate, um, people who are very big on the freedoms and the rights, and I think there's quite a few in there right now, like with Malcolm Roberts and various others and Matt Canavan and that, and one of the reasons I think that they're kind of a bit snookered right now on certain things, is that the laws can't pass unless the Senate actually passes them. Now, because of the way the Senate's set up, it's virtually impossible for any one party to dominate the Senate. That party has to be like Mark McGowan is in WA right now, extreme, extremely popular. He's so popular that with the extraordinary situation that Labor with Mark McGowan controls both the upper and lower house. So pretty much he can pass whatever law he wants, which makes life very interesting in WA until 2025. Now, John Howard, by the way, had the same situation. He was very popular as well. And he had that briefly at one stage. So um, generally you've got to have 38 or more to control the Senate. Usually what happens in practice is that the Senate major parties start making deals with various other people um, as to who does what. So there's 76 members right now in the Senate or things like that. Um, that's how that works right now. So notice that you've got equal um, senators right now in each state. So this stops the bigger countries bullying Tasmania out of existence, for example. The Tasmania, South Australia and WA could gang up against Victoria and New South Wales. So that it just means that they can't force laws to the detriment of any particular states. Um, so if that makes sense to you right now. So it's when you understand how it all works, it's um, really, really interesting. So the current Senate in Australia, for example, right now, the main thing to realise with the House of Representatives, it's really interesting because Liberals barely have control right now. They barely got control and Craig Kelly is their controlling vote to pass the laws, which does significantly limit their ability to do a lot of stuff right now. So here's an example of numbers in the Senate or whatever else right now. So right now, as you can see, the Labor Party have 35 votes. Now, they don't have enough in their own right to pass the laws. The, the coalition don't have enough either. So that's what makes it very, very interesting. They don't have enough to do it um, uh, to basically pass the laws. They're all below 39. So any laws that get passed in Australia right now, they've got to get some assistance um, from either One Nation, Jackie Lambie, the Independent, Central Alliance, or whatever. So that's a fairly encouraging thing, quite a good thing or whatever else. So it does mean that if it's a particularly bad law, they probably wouldn't get it through right now. So they would have to do all kinds of stuff. So once you understand that, the, that the Senate does give that kind of stuff there. We've also got Section 51 of the Constitution that I mentioned, which... This is the one that's least misunderstood. 
And it's really important to actually understand how this baby works. Um, this is not saying that the Commonwealth can pass laws and the states are under the Commonwealth. Quite the contrary. What this provision is saying in simple terms is that anything that the Commonwealth government have got power under this section 51 to, par to pass, the states have to fit in with them. But if it's not specifically listed in section 51, then the Commonwealth has got no power to do it at all, period. So as an example here, there's no real um, provisions that I can see that allows the Commonwealth to make laws with vaccines. And that's one of the reasons why you will notice if you actually read between the lines that ScoMo never really does anything on this area. And he keeps emphasizing, even today emphasize, it comes down to the states to make their decision. Like the example he gave was Mark McGowan mandating it for quarantine workers. And ScoMo is completely correct. So the Commonwealth don't really seem to have a lot of power when it comes to vaccines and this country. But the states do, as you'll see shortly, which can be equally as problematic. So the states, as I mentioned, never wanted to give up their power. So the other thing to realise too, as I mentioned last week, is that this is the executive power provision. This is where ScoMo and that administer their powers. Notice that the politicians don't have any power to do this. It's given to the Governor General or the King of Australia, as I call him. But then the Governor General delegates them to Scott Morrison and to whoever controls the lower house. The other thing I mentioned last week was that the Federal Executive Council <coughs> um, is the group that works for the Governor General. But in practice, that doesn't actually exist. There's no such group in the real world. They just have a cabinet. So you've got this constitution, but no one's really been following it for years. So, and finally, this is the provision that basically talks about the courts. So that's what we went through last week. Okay, so let's get on now to jabs being made mandatory by the Commonwealth or states, which I'm sure would be something that people would have a fairly immense interest in. So before I do any questions or quick things on what I've asked, which you don't understand, just to stay on the topic with that. Anyone got any questions um, before we go on? That's just directly related to that last part, like anything that you don't understand or whatever else. Just checking, if not, that's good. We'll just keep going. some problems here with my computer okay yep got it okay so let me just fix something up here i'm just having a bit of a quick challenge here Yeah, we're on. There's a couple of questions there. Can you? Yep. Are you able to see them or not? Yeah, I am. Hang on, I okay. can see it now. Just give yep. me a sec. I just had to get okay something working, which is being a bit naughty on my computer. Um, okay, so do you mean the monarch after the queen dies? I don't know what you mean by that question, but what I'm so I'm. Well, all I was saying with the Governor General, tongue in cheek, is he's technically the monarch of Australia. So, yes, the Governor General has more power than the PM. That is completely correct when you read the strict constitution as it actually is. So, how is it that the states and the PM run things instead of the executive? Well, that's not quite what's happening. The executive is, is basically, the, the Prime Minister is not in the constitution either. There's no such person. So um, the, the PM basically is the guy who's in charge of the party who controls the amount of the lower house. So that, that basically is the one who ultimately is given the power by the governor general to run the country. So the, the, so the governor general delegates the powers to do that and has more powers. Someone asked about the ramifications of military administration or rollout, it doesn't directly relate to what I just covered. So that may come up later on today. Um, will each state choose if they will enforce mass vaccination laws? That is what it seems to be saying. Yes, that's basically correct. So the states have their own choice and 
there's no doubt that the states are not working uniformly on this. They're all fighting each other. So it's going to be very different um, everywhere. So as I said, I'm not going to answer any questions that don't directly relate um, to what we just covered, which was understanding the revision. So I'm going through all the questions here. None of them seem to. So just hold on to some of these ones here in the question and answer. And Daniel asks, the states of overriding powers over the covenant that we signed. The main thing to understand is that the states have ultimate powers except anything in Section 51. So anything in Section 51, the Commonwealth has, has more power than the state. So Yana, is the PM null and void? Well, not really. I mean, you'd never get that argument in court because what they've done is they've just done something in practice. And if the Governor General is correctly delegating his powers to the PM, which he is, then no, it's not null and void. The PM is perfectly allowed to do it because the Governor General has actually delegated authority. So, um, let's see, any other ones here that relate directly to what we've just covered? Um, does David Hurley have the power to overrule state decisions? No, not state, um, only Commonwealth. Um, I wanted to ask with regards to Section 51, the Constitution has prohibit civil conscription. Um, no, Section 5123A mentions civil conscription, but it's quite specifically in regards to medical stuff. So, okay. Um, the Governor General can, in fact, John says, sack the PM and the government without reason. That is correct. 100% correct. Um, okay. So, Yep. Someone asked the Governor General to override the state. No, they can't. Um, so, okay, the rest of it was covered. Okay, great. So, what I'll do is keep going now, and some of these questions will be covered as we go through the topics today, so to speak. Okay, so... Someone asked, can the monarch overrule the Governor General? Well, in theory, yes, the Queen can actually um, overrule, but in practice won't do it. Um, there's been attempts um, to try to, so to speak, but in, fear, in theory, yes, but in practice, the Queen won't do it. Um, but the Queen can if they wish to. Okay, so now let's just go on to mandatory jabs and just having a little look at this. Um, I'll be honest with you on this one. Uh, There'll be better people than me in terms of the stuff on this, like Nathan Buckley. Um, there's another one, AFL lawyers in Sydney who are really stepping up as well. So there's, um, so basically, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best in my, from what I do know about it and what my, how I see it is in terms of educating. And like I said, not legal advice, just how I actually see it. It depends which government you're talking about, Commonwealth or state. Um, as I see, Section 5123A does not give a Commonwealth authority for mandatory medical treatment. Um, it only allows funding treatment, as is clear by rules of civil conscription. So the Commonwealth can't do it. And that's my opinion. And Nathan Buckley has that view, and I certainly agree with him. So I agree with him on that particular one. The Commonwealth can't mandate vaccines, and they haven't tried to. They um, they bleated a little bit, and briefly, ScoMo said some comment about um, we'll make it as mandatory as possible, but then he clarified his comments later on, and he corrected them. And I remember people freaking out last year when he said that, and I, I just said to someone, now nah, he won't because he hasn't got power. So I said, he's been misconstrued, he's probably misstated it. I think he's just trying to see how people react. Um, that's my reading of the whole thing. And sure enough, he came out and, and clarified it. I said, you don't need to mandate vaccines because I predicted pretty much since about April last year, May, that Australia will easily get 80% taken of the vaccine and against all the arguments from everybody else. And, I, and my reason was very simple. Um, I've been a student of polls. I've got, when I was at university, interestingly enough, my best marks I ever got were statistics. Math's my best subject of anything that I actually can do. So anything to do with numbers, statistics, calculations, I, I, I really get into. You know, I was such a nerd when I was in school, I used to go and analyze sporting matches and 
analyze statistics, I really get, get excited. That's why I became an accountant financial guy. So I've gone through the statistics, the polls, and worked out to get the direct, um, correct data on the state in Australia. Pretty much every poll I've gone into, barring a few percentages, show the following numbers. 35 to 40% are pro-vaccination, like very strongly in favor of it. Of that 35 to 40%, only about 25%, 20 to 25% believe it should be compulsory, so a very low number. Um, of the remaining 60%, there's around about a 35 to 40% what's called um, open vaxxers, is what I call them. They're people who aren't opposed to vaccines, but it, they kind of go case by case. So they've done some vaccines in their time. They're okay with vaccines as a whole, but they don't like this particular one and they don't like a lot of them. So there's 35 to 40 in that category and there's about 20 to 25 who are straight out don't like vaccinations or whatever. So I've been predicting all along that we got, they won't need to mandate it necessarily in Australia because I believe that 80% will take it up. And the reason I believe that, which... Um, and, and they're actually already hitting very high numbers because at 35 to 40% will be taking it and running for it. And in fact, I was reading today in the paper and having a bit of a chuckle, they actually had people like a vaccine lottery trying to push the queue everywhere, like the cover to, you know, um, Pfizer jab or whatever else. So um, there's 35 to 40% there. Of the remaining 40%, I've said they will eventually take the jab, um, the open vaxxers, because they basically they just want to travel they want to go and you know bang a stripper over in vegas or amsterdam they want to go and get drunk with their friends about being locked down and they believe that people who don't take vaccines are the evil ones and by and large want to go and live their meaningless lives without any inhibition and that's my very cruel assessment and i'm and i reckon around the remaining 20 to 25 percent who don't go along with it most of them just won't take it, but there'll be a few who will give in so they can see Aunt Mary over in Spain or whatever else. So Australia is an interesting country like that. And then the only question will be where it goes from there, whether they tried to mandate it for the remaining 20%. So my risk assessment is I think the and nothing's certain. You can never give a definitive opinion. My strong opinion is they won't mandate vaccines in Australia. Um, I would not say that that's a guarantee, obviously, because I can't. My strong opinion is that they won't. Uh, I think they're more likely to make it very difficult in certain states in a coercive way in terms of things. I've been predicting there'll be no jab, no play, and ScoMo came out and virtually said that today. Um, I think certain schools in certain states will require you to have the vaccine for their liability. So by the time you've finished, although it won't be compulsory, um, various places like, and even businesses will voluntarily enforce it out of fear. Um, just because they're getting the rigmarole, they're hearing it, and they want to just do it for liability and to be seen as good citizens. So that's where I personally think that the bigger risk for our country is the business community and the big corporates <coughs> more than the government. Now, I may be wrong on that one, and I... I will openly say to you, there's every possibility I'll be wrong, but I think it's a very small percentage likelihood, just simply because when I've looked at the statistics and the numbers and, what, and what's in favour of it, and governments do follow statistics more closely than anything else. So, yeah, and Mara says about hearing about the military coming in, jabbing on the spot at homes. Again, I've just said to people straight out, number one, I have friends who are soldiers, and I think, number one, most of them are, don't like this either. Number two, in any event, um, yeah, I can see the military possibly helping out with the rollout because basically they've completely botched it and they're all over the place. So there's every chance that the main reason the military are getting involved is just to simply help out with the rollout. But in saying that, for most people, it'd be very intimidating to see soldiers at the door asking if you want one. I'd be very surprised if it's anything other than just an offer, which people can say, take it or leave it. I think it's more likely to be a problem if you only had, say, 50% take up of the jab. That's when it would get very interesting. So my, my belief is that they will get between 70 and 80% without much problem. I have had people I know who were adamant with me last year. They said, there's no way I'd get that outrageous thing. And I remember saying to someone about it, we'll, say, we'll see. I said, most of them will in the end. You watch as soon as their livelihoods are threatened or they feel scared, they'll just do it. And 
and someone I know was telling me straight out about her friends openly said they don't want it, but they know their family are all taking it, their family want them to take it, and they don't want to upset their family. So this is what you're actually dealing with right now. So I think that the reason that I say it's important to understand the psychology and the mechanics of this whole thing is it's very important to see where the real grave risk is and what's called the possible risk. And the one and, and then really go for the grave risks. They're the ones to focus on. An example I'll give, because strategy is everything. And the reason I had great success as a lawyer wasn't because I was the smartest lawyer. In, in fact, I was probably quite average and mediocre, I'll be honest with you. And I'm not just downplaying myself. I don't think I was a particularly great lawyer, but I did really well because I'm very strategic and I'm, a, and I'm very smart in terms of um, things like that, you know? So very, so I remember getting top marks in my leaving examination with high school and I was lazy, you know, I was lazy. I basically, at the time I did mine, everything relied on the final exam. So what I did was I went and bought all the past year's exam papers about six weeks before. I, I analyzed all of them statistically. I worked out the probable likelihood that questions to be repeated. I worked out every three to four years they repeated their questions. I created my own simulation exam paper. I studied only for that and left everything out, took a huge risk. It paid off and I, and I ducked economics. And I was such a naughty child in that school, but they actually had me, um, you know, sitting at, sitting at the front of the room. And the reason that was, was I assessed what was the real risk and what wasn't the real risk. So in this situation, I think strategy is just as important as understanding the law, you know, just as important. So I personally believe that the biggest risk that we've got right now is the coercive vaccines in places like schools, um, places like the workplace, and for things like flying, if your life and your business has a lot to do with flying, that is where I see as the real risk. And these ones, the government doesn't actually have to do much because the schools themselves will be pushing it. Many of the parents in the schools will be pushing it and you're going to have the airlines pushing it. And that's what I see as the bigger issue. Then I think government, unfortunately, playing it very smart at the moment. Um, if they were really silly and just went and passed obviously illegal laws, it would make life easier. But I think they're being very smart. Um, I watched the government do this in Australia over the years when I was a lawyer. And I used to shake my head at their ingeniousness. They would, they would generally pass laws. They would make things optional, but they'd make it absolutely very hard to function without going within the laws. So that's those kind of things like, yeah, like no jabs. They said, oh, well, and the hospital might just say, we won't let you in unless you've been jabbed for protection. Um, people who played AFL last year were actually having to wear, um, the AFL um, football players and rugby players were getting huge pressure to get vaccinated with the flu vaccine last year. So it's important to understand that this mandatory thing, I personally think Australia is in trouble, but more because the people are very stupid. And now that could really offend some people, but it's the truth. I think, and, I, and in saying that, I hate to say this, most of the supposed awake people are, I, I put in that category because get caught up and get worked up about issues and, and, and really make up what I call spurious arguments that have got little chance of success. So it's really important if you're going to keep your freedoms that you be educated and that you be wise and that you focus on something you've got some chance of addressing. So one of the things I, I did with my clients, for example, and got people I knew who I trust and really like to do was, and, and clients, was teaching them to break their dependence on the system and really get themselves as much as they can so they've got as much sovereignty as they can in their life. And that's what they, and, and the ones who've done that are very grateful for doing that. I took steps to break all my licenses with the government for that reason as well myself. So all that kind of stuff and things like that. So section 109, so this is where it gets interesting. So Nathan Buckley argues that the Commonwealth can't mandate vaccines. I completely agree with him. He does also argue the states can't do it because of section 109, I disagree with him on that one myself. I don't think he's correct on that one. I think he's hoping to succeed in court. I'll be very surprised pleasantly if he does. And the reason why section 109 says the following, it says, um, when a law of the state is inconsistent with the law of the Commonwealth, the latter shall prevail and the former shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be valid. 
One question I can see I will answer, Cheryl Lee has mentioned about GPs um, pushing it. Well, I can tell you now, because I have a very good friend, GP, who's a very awake man, who openly told me and has shown me things like, um, there's memos out now by APRA who regulate doctors that have said, if you speak against vaccines, they'll strike you up. It's that simple. So doctors are dealing with extortion more than anyone. So section 109, when a law of the state is inconsistent, the latter shall prevail. But the key words are the former shall to the extent of the inconsistency be invalid. So section 109, as Malcolm Roberts points out in his video of One Nation, he says it only applies if there's an inconsistent state Commonwealth law, which I agree. And the Commonwealth has not passed any laws, which they could, um, in theory, saying that mandatory vaccine scenes weren't allowed. If that happened, I believe the states could probably contest it and argue that the Commonwealth has no power under Section 51 to pass such a law. And I think the state, states would win because Section 51 does not give the Commonwealth power to make laws on vaccines. And this is, and that, unfortunately, that works both ways. They can't mandate vaccines, but I certainly don't believe they can pass laws stopping the states from doing it. So generally, it would have to be a very broad interpretation of Section 109 and Section 51, Set 23, for basically the states to be stopped from doing vaccines. The, you have to have a very generous high court with judges who really don't like this whole vaccine things and willing to stand up and do what's right and take a very broad one. And what they will do is say that, that the third test is the fact that the Commonwealth government have even been mentioned regards to medical treatment and quarantine in Section 51.23 and Section 51.9, but therefore um, there's no, the states can't make those laws. I, I can't see why they would do that. I think that the correct test is one of these first two things. Uh, is it impossible to obey both laws? And I think that would be the test that would probably be applied in that situation. So in summary, my view is that the states can, under the constitutions, pass laws mandating vaccines. And so that's my opinion on that one, unfortunately. I think they can do that. Do I think they will do it in practice? Um, WA and Victoria have already done it. Other states have not done it. Does that mean that WA and Victoria will enforce it? Victoria, I, I, well, anything could happen over there. WA, I have my doubts, um, only because um, the, the law was passed by the previous Premier. Um, who was well known for certain things. I'd be very surprised if the current um, Premier did try and do that. But in saying that, nothing's impossible. So, but in any event, WA has a very high take-up rate for vaccines. And I think people that... And one of the things I'll just mention here as a passing comment, generally you tend to make your judgments on things based on the people you hang out with. And an example I'll give you, is let's just say that you've got 20 close friends and all of them are very wealthy um, financial people. Or you start to think like them and then you start to assume that everyone thinks like that because you say, yeah, well, everyone I know thinks like this. This is, by the way, why um, it's believed, for example, that um, if you actually go, if you want to know one way to predict the US election, look at what the CEOs of big companies are saying. Every single election, I think, for the last like 10 elections in America, the CEO polls have got it wrong every single time, um, except for the most recent one. And even that one, well, yeah, I have my doubts about the result of that election. So generally, I find many people who are awake or aware of this stuff assume that, well, all my friends I know are like this, Australia is waking up. The answer is actually not. If you actually look at um, a lot of people who are day-to-day -day people, there's no doubt in my mind the majority have not as yet woken up in any way, shape or form and it's still a relative minority. So it's just important to understand that and realize the community sentiment is still going a certain way. So it's gonna take immense strength and understanding of this stuff. So as I mentioned, Nathan Buckley has his views. He is going to court and arguing that the states can't pass those laws nor the Commonwealth. I hope he wins, I don't think he will. That's my <clears throat> opinion on that one. So, my view is that um, the states can do it if they want. I don't think in practice they're necessarily going to do that, but I think they're going to definitely, um, I think make it <coughs> very difficult in certain jobs and doing certain things. Um, 
if you put your kids in public schools, um, it's one of the reasons why we homeschooled our kids. As soon as COVID started happening last year, yeah, the last remaining one in school was our 15, uh, 14 year old at the time. We pulled him out in record time and because we could see this coming. So at the end of the day, if your kids are in public school or in any kind of schools, <clears throat> you're going to have to be strong and you're definitely going to have to teach your kids to um, <clears throat> empower. This is one of the reasons we run our youth. Um, we run Thursday youth trainings for, um, basically to help as well, to teach people to be empowered sovereign youth. All my four sons um, are, are sovereign and, in, and three of them are involved in business and doing their own investments and things like that. Um, so one of the reasons why was from young, we've taught them to be sovereign. <clears throat> we've taught them about vaccines. We've taught them about their rights and freedoms. So one of the best things you can do with your kids with schools is not be afraid for your kids to stand out and teach them. It'd be very, if they just simply turn up and refuse to, for example, do certain things, um, well, it'll be very, it gets very, very interesting for the, for the schools to do much about it. And there's, there's things like that. So I'll go into all that a bit more shortly. So that's in summary with, the, with that. Is there other ways we can address this? Yes, there is. But understand that legally, if you're putting your hope that, that the laws will be knocked out under the Constitution, I think you're holding on to a false hope. I hope you're wrong. I hope that I'm incorrect. And I'd be very happy to be you know, proven wrong on this kind of stuff or for the High Court to go differently. But yeah, I can't see how the states don't have the power to do that if they don't want to under the Constitution. There is an argument of an overarching human right, but I'll cover that one shortly. The Nuremberg Code I mentioned last week, um, it does not apply in Australia unless adopted in the legislation. Um, only ACT has, has given those rights to prevent that. So the Nuremberg Code you can ignore in Australia um, quite correctly. So let's go now and have a look at the state of emergency um, or things like that. Now, before I do, Shirley says it seems that jabs could be made mandatory, but bullying is allowed. Um, can government disadvantage citizens who choose no jab? Okay, here's the problem, Shirley. I mean, he, he or she who hands out the money can choose who they give it to. So if governments are giving out grants and giving out payments, well, they can make their conditions upon them. They may be highly discriminatory, but they can do it. Um, I personally believe this is why, and Robert Kiyosaki shared this a lot in his stuff as to what he saw of things. I reckon governments have been trying to, to creep in socialism for some time to get people to be dependent upon the government financially, because then they can pass whatever horrible laws they want to do it. It's no different to that toxic partner that some women get or some men get who basically make sure they control the purse strings and then kind of force their partners into submission by manipulating them financially. It's the same kind of deal. So um, in terms of legally disadvantaged people to vaccinate, um, yeah, look, I think the problem is that they can get away with it and until enough people start to say this isn't the way to go. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think dying or whatever else like that. So um yeah no absolutely so okay so someone saying about the meaning of mandate in relation to jab well mandate just means making it compulsory really so um that's what it means so i don't think they'll mandate it that's why i personally think that you know the worst thing that the fact that the awake movement ever did was create a march called millions march against mandatory vaccination because they've pretty much knocked out their ability to influence on their branding straight away because technically it's not mandatory right now so most business people don't take it seriously so i think it was the silliest idea they ever did whereas some kind of branding around coercive vaccination and you know affecting jobs this is why now people are listening because there are people now who are starting to do that like nathan buckley and others about the extortion that goes on with it and that's getting people's attention so, so is it legal for the government to pressure businesses and schools so that they have rules that you cannot enter without being injected well 
it's not legal, but you can certainly make things hard and withdraw funding. Um, so, yeah, it's... <laughs> Ellie, I'm so glad finally said what a waste these marches were. Oh, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's just silly. It's just, it's caused more harm than good. And it frustrated the heck out of me because I thought, um, yeah, I mean, I would like to see some really good, organized, well-branded, effective, rationally run protest movements. Um, I think that could help a lot. Whereas I think the ones in Australia are just plain stupid. That's just my opinion. And um, no doubt they will upset a lot of people and I've, and I've upset people and I've said that, but I don't really care, you know? I'd like to see some really good ones. And I think that really good, well-run, organized protests, um, I think you'd get a lot of people interested right now. So um, let's go on to state of emergency now. So it's very important to understand, um, it's only meant to be for temporary situations to give dictatorship and control to sort out an urgent mess. Um, it suspends civil rights and liberty um, it also suspends constitutional rights for the states, although arguably, in my view, not necessarily Commonwealth rights, but it certainly are. The, the biggest thing you've got to understand of a state of emergency is I'll try and show you in a simple picture form what they're doing, and you'll see the problem. So you may remember that right now, the states under a constitution and a healthy functioning government constitution, the government basically has to obey the laws. So the executive like the, the, the WA or Victorian or New South Wales Premier, uh, Scott Morrison and his gang, they have to go in large with what the legislation says they're allowed to do. When you've got a state of emergency approved by the parliament, this means that all rights get suspended the laws get suspended and these guys can do whatever the heck they want. So now they don't pass laws anymore. They pass these things called mandates, which I'll go into more shortly in the next topic. But they pass these things called mandates, which means where um, or regulations. So that's why you get this mask mandate. And like in West Australia, as an example, the mask mandate was signed by the commissioner of police. Now, why is that? Because the state of emergency was declared by the Emergency Services Commissioner Fran, Fran, Fran Logan last year, in March 2020, and the state of emergency legislation delegated the authority to the Commissioner of Police, so and as well as well as to the Deputy Chief Health Officer. So that's why the two people who run WA is Chris Dawson and the Chief Health Officer Andrew Robertson. They're the two who run the state now. The politicians are just not doing anything, and by and large the premier is just really doing what these people tell him so that's that's what's actually happening now so when you realize a situation you can see the problem and why it should only ever be for very extreme situations so to speak so basically state of emergencies were only imposed in perilous times like bushfires cyclones epidemics or pandemics foreign acts of wars so a very good example of martial law that was declared was in 1860s when the Civil War broke out in America. So Abe Lincoln actually declared martial law and suspended all the rights. Um, and that meant that any US constitutional rights, any legislation, all were suspended and basically whatever Lincoln said went. But Lincoln did that for a good reason. He had to bring some order with the slavery thing and to try and help the country. So. Um, Martial law is actually meant to um, only is only meant to come in in certain situations. So that's the sole reason why martial law comes in. It's purely designed to um, give protection in really perilous times in society, so to speak. So the ancients knew very well what this meant. This is why U.S. forefathers were really, really cautious how they framed their constitution. Um, so Lord Blackstone in his commentaries pretty much said this, woe to the people whose governments declares martial laws in times of peace to remove their common law liberties. So you really got to not be led by, into misled by these people. And the problem that you've got right now with the current legal system is until this um, state of emergency nonsense is kind of kicked out, they can do what by and large they actually want. 
And that's the problem. And I would love to get up and say something different. I would be wrapped if I could get up and give some magnificent Magna Carta speech to you and all that kind of stuff. But to bring in something like that comes on a deeper argument, not argued under the way the Constitution and the current legal system is actually functioning. It will come under a much deeper thing, which I'll be sharing in the common week, like the, um, what do you call it? The, um, the William Penn case, which I'll be covering next week, which was a famous case about trial by jury, where William Penn blatantly broke the law of the, that was brought in, but he argued there was a much deeper law under God which took priority over man's laws, which he, he won because the judge was forced to agree by the jury and by the members of the public rising up and saying that. So that's the kind of thing it's going to take. It's going to take a getting back to the common law, the, the reason for common law rights. So common law rights exist because, we're, because basically we're people who are created by God who then have certain inalienable um, you know, inherent rights and freedoms. And that's what William Penn argued in his case and, um, and many other cases where they've seen amazing changes and reformations. It's getting back to the fact that governments are only meant to do laws to administer. And when you actually go back to the original words in the Constitution, and in many of the great times of um, tremendous changes that actually happened, as an example, um, the key is the very initial words that came in there. Um, so when you go into Section 51 of the Constitution, I want to show you something here. So when I go back there, notice these words. The peace, order, and good government of the Commonwealth. So these, this is the reason that we have laws for peace, for order, and for good government. Now, it's very arguable that what's going on now is definitely not peace for peace and not for good government. It's to take people's liberties away. So that's the kind of argument you'd be going right back to the inalienable laws of the blessing of Almighty God that are meant to be for the peace, order, and good government. So right now, though, it's very important to realise that a state of emergency means that, by and large, that the chief health officer and the Commissioner of Police, by and large, are, pa are making the mandates and passing the laws. So when they lock down, they issue mandates. You'll notice they're often issuing new ones. So, um, and each time they issue a mandate, um, the, 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 the mandate basically is often being changed and turned around. So when I say martial law too, it doesn't necessarily mean the military is even involved. It just means that, <clears throat> Martial law just means that one or person by and large is running the place. So that's how this happens. So WA as an example, section 58 of the Emergency Management Act. The reason why WA only does 14 day rolling ones, and look, I really wanna emphasize here, one of the things that it's very important is that when you're standing up to be awake, you do it on correct facts and correct understanding. Now, people talk about these rolling state of emergencies and they always bring a lockdown in just when it's happening. Yes, that's definitely true in some of the states like Queensland, which have got longer periods. WA, every 14 days, they're a new state of emergency. And we haven't had a lockdown every time it's happened. So WA's legislation um, is probably the most, um, the best legislation in Australia because it recognises that they're only meant to be temporary, whereas the other ones tend to allow longer. The WA only allows, you know, um, 14 days maximum. That's why every 14 days they renew it. So when you read the Act, it appoints Emergency Management Commissioner, which is the Commissioner of, of Police, Chris Dawson. So, and when you go into seeing it there, you will see it, it actually says what it's for, like fire hazards, um, disasters, um, pandemics, um, wars, all that kind of stuff. A classic example where this would apply is that WA has a major bushfire that's coming into the city <clears throat> and, or a major flood or cyclone that could destroy our city. Or let's just say that we just heard that China's invaded in the north and coming towards Perth with troops. That's where state of emergencies are meant to be for. Or a real pandemic breaks out, something where bodies are literally hitting and lining up in the street and to stop the panic and bring order. So that's what, uh, that's what emergency management is meant to be for. 
So when used properly, it's a damn good thing to have. You know, the last thing you need when you've got a cyclone coming to destroy the city is everyone running around arguing their common law rights. It would just be disastrous. Now, unfortunately, what we're dealing with here, though, is a situation where they're pretty much misusing it, so to speak. So Victoria have made that one. So the question is, can this be overcome? Well, one possibility is to challenge it for an abusive process. Now, here's where I'll admit my legal knowledge falls short. I don't quite know. Uh, it would be just because it's a state court, it probably would end up going into a state Supreme Court and then go to a high court. That's my guess. But like I said, but suffice to say for now that the argument is that is there actually a pandemic? And is this really an emergency? Now, the issue with that is this. I think most of us know that um, it's seriously questionable whether this is an emergency. Unfortunately, more than half the country would disagree with what I've just said just then. And it would take a very brave high court to get up and say that the pandemic is a scam and that all the governments are scamming. That would take a very brave high court and Supreme Court. So I can't see that happening. Even if this was brought on, I'd be absolutely surprised as heck if this, if that won. It would take a major spiritual mind consciousness revolution in Australia, which really brought change. So it's possible, but like I said, I'm a statistician at heart, and I think that the this would be a little bit like me betting on um a two, on on the on the three hundredth seed in Wimbledon beating Novak Djokovic in the final as an example, or beating in, in round one, you know, uh, when Djokovic is already two sets up. Um, the odds would be something insane. It would be Ilat Nokovic winning 6-0, 6-1 in the first two sets and then placing a bet that a the number 250 ranked is going to beat him. It's nothing's impossible, but the odds are against you, you know? So another one is that a state parliament steps up and refuses to renew an extension. Now, this nearly happened last year in Victoria. They were the outrageous behaviour... <clears throat> The one time I thought this could actually be stopped because there were three politicians who weren't happy with Daniel Andrews and felt he was majorly overusing his power. And he didn't have enough numbers in the upper house. The, um, and as you may remember, what I've mentioned here is that you've got to actually have um, the upper house here is the one that gives the checks and balances. They're the ones who must approve. So Daniel Andrews and his cronies passed them over here. When they went there, they hit a brick wall. <clears throat> so in the end, unfortunately, the three politicians came over the line, but they did put some limitations on Daniel Andrews as doing what he wanted. But at least that was some, um, you know, at least <clears throat> showing potentially what could happen if some politicians had some balls or a pussy or whatever else you want to call it. Um, and the third one here is <clears throat> considered rebellion. So many times in times past, citizens, when there's outrageous laws, have just straight out refused to obey them, like lawful rebellion, and simply turn around and say, on the God's higher law, this is a straight out scam. We refuse to do this. Now, <clears throat> that happened in the William Penn case. That is certainly an option that you can actually do. But you have to know what you're doing because you're basically taking on the state of emergency and you have to be really, really willing to pay the price. Rodney Howard Brown in Florida last year, who was a pastor, when they brought the lockdown in, he made a decision to do a considered rebellion. He actually just got straight up with his church, biggest church in Florida, <clears throat> and said, we're not doing it. The sheriff arrested him and locked him in jail. He told his church to pray and keep going regardless. I'm not sure how long it took, whether it was a week, two weeks or three weeks, but the church has been all stepped up as well and rebelled. And um, the result of it was because of the rebellion was that the Florida sheriff 
came and severely and sincerely apologized to him and they changed their lockdown orders and they exempted the churches. Now, of course, the rest is history. People are talking about Florida. It's mentioned about how free it is. But I'm, I'm sure most of you haven't heard about that. But it was a very considered rebellion that took place in Florida last year. That's why this happened, because the people said, no, 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 no. You're not going to do this. And key, key leaders of the community stepped up and did that. So but why are we, am I not doing it in Australia? I just don't think we're there. I, in you, when I looked at the statistics and the numbers, the churches are not willing to step up. The key leaders in business are not. There's very few exceptions. I think the closest I've seen is Jim's mowing. You know, Jim, Jim's mowing has really kind of been courageous and made some attempt to push back. And there's been a few, but they've been the minority. And that's been the problem. So you really are fighting a lone cause. There's a pastor called Pastor Paul, someone in Melbourne, who's, who tried to do what Rodney Brown did, and he got pretty much criticised. And he's been in jail indefinitely with no, you know, no rights for, for, for weeks, so to speak, now. So, so while it's in place, the delegate authority is a dictator. So it can be overcome, <clears throat> but you've got to realize these are your three options, you know? So considered rebellion is what I call it. And many have done that in times past. They have just done this thing called considered rebellion. Um, and, I, and I would say, well, I'm gonna put some more words in that one as well, as a child of God, so to speak. In other words, your God-given liberties and rights. So, okay, so before we go, I'll actually, I'll go into mandates versus legislation, then I'll take some questions on that part before we go into the final part about the overarching common law um, or inalienable rights. So let me just quickly cover mandates versus legislation a little bit. Um, and sorry, yeah, I've got some other stuff as well. So this is the main thing to understand here. Legislation is a parliament mandates to the executive. So this is why when WA's parliament, lower house, passed a state of emergency and then it was confirmed in the upper house in Victoria that last year, this then gave full authority to the executive to run the country in accordance with legislation, which is the commissioner of police in most places. So the remedy is overturning the law or taking it to court um, for interpretation. Um, mandates or, or regulations there is a remedy in the administrative law. My feeling is that's why one of the reasons that um, some fines have been showing out because mandates are vague and certain things like that. So administrative law means that you can challenge decisions of the executive and claiming that they were outside their power or what's called ultra vires. So ultra vires means beyond power. So for example, if the regulations, if the legislation if they pass a state of a law under their state of emergency power, but there's no relevance to running the emergency, it's arguable it's ultra virus. I don't know why, and I think lawyers who are who are practicing now, which I'm not anymore, like I said, I'm just educating you, would know better. I have a hunch that some of the fines would not basically survive a court case under administrative law, because the argument would be that they're just an overreaction certain laws to basically um that they're going a little bit too far the certain mandates and they exceed the power given in the state of emergency so that could be one reason why i'm not saying it is so but it could well be one there so mandates can be used for severe abuse um so politicians making um you know laws outside of parliament going against the purpose of the constitution so this is why mandates are a real problem um because they really allow certain individuals to do whatever they whatever they want to do, which, as you can guess, is really um, unfortunate, so to speak. So, okay, so what we're gonna do now is, um, so for example, lockdowns. Are lockdowns permitted, um, basically, in state of emergency? And the answer, unfortunately, says yes. I mean, every, um, pan, genuine pandemics in history, lockdowns have been a normal response. 
The recent High Court decisions with Clive Palmer certainly seem to suggest that extreme measures to manage it are permissible. So people saying the lockdowns are not legal, well, like I said, you've got to cast out the state of emergency first. Until that's cast out, the states can actually do that. And I don't see how you could argue that they can't. There's been a few people try to take court cases, business owners, and they've all lost their cases. So, um, okay, let's go into the next part. So what I want to do here, first of all, I want to commend all of you for coming along and being the ones who came here last week. I'm going to pause the recording. Um, so let me know, guys, once it's recorded, because I'm going to share a bit more on some stuff. And, you know, I'm going to basically pause the recording for a little bit, and then we'll come back to it. So I'm going to resume the recording. I just re re realized that. So yeah, so as I said, so I'll just go back over this for the recording. Um, is there an overarching human right to stop this? I've said, yep. Yeah. Um, my belief is that we have this, you got to know your, um, who you are. This is the first thing I learned in an underground movement and know that first and foremost, you are a sovereign being. And if you don't know that, you can learn every single legal right under the planet and you're still going to get your ass knocked over. So um, that's the first thing I mentioned. And knowing that basically governments are public servants and we're the masters. And then I mentioned this here. So one of the things you will soon realize is we are in a spiritual battle because everything that happens in the physical world happens first in the spiritual realm. And this is something I learned years ago. And just as an aside for you all, they teach this in the Masonic Lodge. Um, there's Stuart Swerdlow, a CIA guy who came out and he, Wrote, uh, reveal the fact that they've actually got people there who do energetic psychic attacks upon people in the CIA and higher levels. So they do all this kind of stuff to mentally tamper with people's etheric bodies, astral bodies, and things like that. So there is a real, um, you know, basically frequency or whatever else. Um, so basically against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So one of the things in the art of war, and we are in a war right now, um, this is the best way to win a war is when you can win without fighting. I still remember when I was 11 and I had a kid wanting to beat me up and he surrounded me. He'd been a friend of mine and everyone was cheering him on. And I just said to him, I'm not fighting you. You used to be my friend. I said, I'm not doing it. He said, no, you've got to fight me. And he was kind of a bit taken aback. He goes, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. And I said, well, I'm not fighting you. So he grabbed me, threw me on the ground and jumped on top of me, pulled his fist back and I just didn't move. And in the end, he stopped and goes, oh, for goodness sake, he goes, I can't fight you and you're not going to fight back. And he just got up and stormed off to the complete shock of everyone. Next day, he came up to me, we laughed and we made up again. And there's an old saying, but if you've got two people in the tug of war and one lets go, the other one falls over. And this is what all the Kriya, all the yogis teach in the Kriya Yoga, yogis, the... Um, the Buddhist teachings, the, um, the, ta the Tao, they all teach this stuff. So subdue the enemy without any kind of fighting. Um, it's important to outfit your enemy when you're out fight. Everything I do, whether it's not wearing a mask, whether it's what I do, I've given so much thought and so much planning and pondered everything through in detail. Because, and learning to think how they're thinking, trying to understand what they're actually doing or whatever. So, um, and in saying that, I'm obviously not saying you become a complete pacifist. There's a, and I think one of the things that happens in all of this is that people who go from one extreme to the other, you've got one extreme who are all fight, fight, fight. Another extreme of people who just sit there and kind of just meditate and sing Kumbaya and think that God will make everything right. And the answer is somewhere in the middle. You know, ultimately staying centered. You can't fight if you're not starting to stay centered. Um, but at the same time, you've got to take action. You've got to step up and stand firm and do what's right. So sometimes we need to lose a small battle in order to win the war. That's probably one big lesson that this current group can learn in Australia, to realise that these things can sometimes take some time to win. I'm finding that the intelligent people who've got money or those who thought this through are all saying the same thing now. They're saying, look, we've definitely got a problem right now. It's not going to change too quickly. We've got to batten down our hatches for now. 
but they're kind of allowing a few defeats for now while preparing their strategy to ultimately win the war. And that's how I see this. Ultimately, we wish to win the war and win the big picture. In the short term, we have a problem because, and look, this may sound terrible, but I do think that this whole experiment is going to probably see a lot of people end up, um, you know, passing away from all of this kind of stuff. And as time goes on, if more of that happens, people will start to say, hang on a sec. I'm noticing now that people who are right on board, are, although haven't come over yet, more people I know who are right on board are at least questioning and saying, oh, I'm not just sure. And I even had one of the most pro-vax people who I know um, say to me the other day, I'm starting to doubt if the vaccine is going to solve the problem, which I was so sure it was, because it doesn't seem to be making much difference in England. So that was encouraging for me because this is someone who's as pro pro this jab as anyone I know. And she openly just said, look, I'm not so sure it's going to actually solve the problem. And, you know, it does seem to be a bit rushed and I'm getting nervous about the whole thing myself. So anyway, so many means you take charge and control of your own life and you have the power to govern yourself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. So ultimately, I do believe that with all my heart that there is an overarching human right um that applies against any experimental medical treatment i think that that there's no doubt but god's law in the same way in william penn's case held that you cannot suppress freedom of religion there's an absolute underlying holy law of god but they've got no right to force an experimental jab into your body it's no different to like china when they passed the law saying you only allowed to have one child if any more you had to get them knocked off by the government that was an obvious situation where there was a higher law, as Frederick Bastiat says in his book, Law, but says this is wrong, you know. The fact that something is legal doesn't make it lawful, and that's pretty cool. Just because something is legal does not make it lawful. So doesn't in any way make it lawful. They're two entirely different things. So that's really important to see that here. Just because it's legal does not make it lawful. So even if they legally said and came out tomorrow that you, like you, we can force an experimental treatment, there's no way it's lawful. Section 158 of the WA Public Health Act, as far as I'm concerned, is no way that is lawful. You know, it may be legal, but for that to come out and say they can experiment and put things into people's bodies and tie them down and strip their under off to put a vaccine in, as they do right now in WA, that may be legal, but it's not lawful. It may be legal to take 80% of someone's money for tax, but it's not lawful. So it's really important to get that. And you've got to know that within yourself first and foremost, know it. If you have it in your head, your intellect, it will get absolutely nowhere. So the common law, the law of Moses, the Holy Bible, the higher law. In fact, um, in the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church Archbishop openly, they were teaching that, that the law of God, the higher law, takes priority over the law of the land when there's a, a difference. All major political reformations I can find in my research that happened and worked always had some kind of recognition of this higher law, this universal sovereignty, of some kind of underlying God-given higher human right um, to be God to be God-given subjects. Like the Magna Carta came out of that. Common law, one of my favourite is the Armada, 1588, with Queen Elizabeth, one of my favourite ones, along with William Penn. Incredible story what happened there. Um, you know, incredibly. Um, yeah, someone says the latest outbreak lady was fully vaccinated. Yeah, look, people in the UK are fully vaccinated, getting COVID everywhere right now. So <laughs> quite funny, isn't it? So ways, as I'm saying here, to overcome ultimately this whole law, you've got constitutional law, I don't believe that will work. Overturning the state of emergency, well, that would take um, a state to rise up and get a change in the political system. So that's, to go that way, that's a legal solution, number one. Number two is a political solution, where you're going to have to really get the right politicians in place and start to wake up the politicians to represent the people. And, um, and finally, and I think the one that has the greatest chance of success is a spiritual law, which is the underlying right on the higher common law or natural law. 
So the conclusion is it's not an understatement to say that a spiritual awakening is essential and this has to take some kind of involvement in the political. So whatever your part to play in it, no doubt there'll be some of you who feel a political pull and call. And that'd be amazing for those who do because we need people who are willing to do that and step up in politics and make a difference. So um, now questions. And I'm really pleased I'm running on time. I said it would be within two hours and I reckon I'm gonna pull that off, which is a nice pleasant surprise. So um, let's see, is Steve on there? Because Steve's pretty good at filtering questions. Uh, yes, Warren, I'm here. Yes, I'll let you help me out, Steve. Any questions you see that are really useful and not and, and compelling? Um, yeah, okay, let me go through. Um... Um, um, so are you saying businesses can enforce mask mandates despite exemptions? I think you probably answered that as yes, haven't you? I think they can, yeah. The only possibility is that there is some argument by some about disability law and privacy of the Commonwealth. And I'm, yeah, I don't understand it. I must admit, um, I'm hoping it's right. But yeah, I... Yeah, look, I don't understand it all that well. I think there is some discrimination law about disability, but I don't understand it well enough. Okay, if we interact with the police, um, oh, that just moved. If we interact with the police, can we still um, exercise our right to remain silent? Uh, martial law, I think, arose that right. So, um, from my understanding, so you can certainly not say anything at all whatsoever. But, um, and generally, my view is the less you say, the better. But the way martial law works is, is guilty until proven innocent. That's why it's such a problem. So if you say nothing, they can assume you're guilty unless you speak out otherwise. So it all depends on the term of the mandate and how it's written or whatever else. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Warren. More good news in that one. <laughs> um, uh, any discrimination, anti discrimination laws, do they provide any protection against, protection against forced vaccinations? Um, I highly doubt it. Okay, Myself. okay, yep. Natasha's asked, can you talk about digital vaccine passports? Well, yeah, I mean, this is the other problem, isn't it? If someone controls the system that does it, see, Florida, they're not doing it because the people are um, pushed back and the church is pushed back. I mean, over here, I mean, can most people honestly see in Australia and push back much at all? I mean, we have got some good politicians pushing back, like um, George Christensen, um, Malcolm Roberts, Pauline Hansen. There is quite a lot of the senators that seem to be pushing back. So that, um, the thing is that you've got there is it's an executive function, the passports and things like that. So, yeah, I'm, it's, uh, I mean, that's just a disgusting concept to me, but I'm inclined to think they can do it if people don't speak out enough about the whole thing with the digital vaccine. I think they can do it myself. But like I said, um, I'm hoping that they're wrong. I certainly think they'll probably have some kind of um, exemption in the passports. There has to be. And if there's not, well, yeah, the best thing is to push back right now and say, look, you know, this is just not going to be on. The thing to remember, too, with a lot of this is that if a very large percentage, even if at first the government didn't listen, don't push back uh, or push back, um, if a lot of people stood firm and boycotted companies that were basically doing stuff like this, the companies would start to bleed financially, even they get angry and they push back. I've seen some very pro-vax people who, when their companies are starting to hurt with the lockdowns, are now whinging about it. Now they're not happy about lockdowns. So money talks. Yep. Okay. Another one. Are you saying the ICCPR ratified by Australia in 1980 has no bearing in state law? I have no idea what that is. Um, okay. I'd rather be honest than bullshit. I have no idea. All right. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, um, okay, just have a look at some last ones. Um, um, Someone said the current state of emergency is against the law, in my opinion. How are they getting away with it? Temple, Shirley, the politicians are passing it. Yeah. Um, oh, you've, you've answered um, about stay-at-home orders and mandates, not laws. Um, you've, you've addressed that um, in that um, state of emergency, you know, that 
everything's out the window. A mandate's the same thing, basically. Yeah. Um, Someone's asked about, are you going to talk about the QR code? Um, the QR code, yeah, well, depends on your state. I mean, I don't see how, as Nathan Buckley says, I mean, that depends on you having your phone. I mean, I don't generally carry my phone in the businesses. Now, WA, they have to give the option of a paper register. If they ask me to complete the paper register, I just complete it. But I've been asked three times in about, you know, the nine months it's been in over here. So, um, and what I also do is I insist on being exact on the time I was in. So I said, I do not want to be contacted if I was. Let's say that I go into 702, I sign in 702, and then I'll actually write on the register myself. At 708, I left. So that means that that will protect me in the future. So that's what I personally do. And I just don't bring my phone in. I just refuse to use my phone. So that's my approach on that one. I just don't bring it in. And if they want the paper register, by all means, you know, I'll complete it. Um, but I'm very precise on what I write on there. Yeah, it's a bit, different in, a bit different in Queensland. They, they've now sort of mandated that all businesses must, you know, use the QR code. Um, well, that may be the case, for the, yeah. but I mean, if I was in Queensland, I mean, I just wouldn't carry my phone into the shop. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you just don't carry it in. I mean, there's no law in Queensland, from my understanding, that says you've got to carry a phone, is there? <laughs> well, is there? <laughs> well, 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 there probably will be tomorrow. You watch. <laughs> well, if there is, that, that's, another, that, that's, yeah, well, that's a different story. Then yeah. you've got to think that. But right now, if there's no law, you've got to carry a phone. You don't carry a phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we did have a couple of questions about sovereignty and mortgages. Are you better off having not having a mortgage to be more sovereign? Um, That's a good question. And I'm going to, I'll be covering that in the financial one I'm doing in two weeks from now. But the short answer is I don't like mortgages and I don't like property in this kind of time because the easiest thing for governments to take off you is your properties and mortgages leave you very vulnerable. So I don't like mortgages myself, but that's just my opinion. Um, others may give you different things. I don't like them. And yes, the more, my, my opinion, and I stress my opinion, is not having a mortgage definitely makes you more sovereign. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sylvie says, thank you. This is great. I love the way you're pressing all this information. Thank you. It's very yeah, kind of yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, Carissa asks, is there no one who can step in and stop the state of emergency? There are good people who can see this and end it. Now, unfortunately, I don't think that Prince Charming is going to ride on his white horse um, and stop this. I think it's going to take the people to change their politicians. And like I said at the start, Carissa, if it's a spiritual awakening of consciousness that happens in the happens and politicians will start and then start demanding honest politicians we'll get them you know right now we get crooks because by and large most of our country is crooks that's my opinion anyway yeah um when you say pushback warren how do we do that write letters to local politicians etc what else that's one way um i think you've got to go on multiple 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 layers i think that's one way i think if you're led to do protests and you want to be smart about it well that's one way um definitely letters to them um i think boycotting shops and things like that i mean you just got to look at someone like tash peterson i mean whether you agree with her or not she's absolute fruitcake but she's like this radical um vegan and she walks into kfc and shops i don't know if you read it and she will wear these outfits covered in blood and be yelling at everyone about how they're killing animals and eating them and she knows every time she does, she's going to be kicked out and she's going to be booed out and everyone's going to hate her. And she just goes on and goes straight to the next place. Um, whether you agree with her or not, she's got some courage and she knows what she's about. So I think that you're going to need a lot more people who are like, like that. No problem. And who's smart and who just go, nah, fuck this. And they start to speak out. Some people will be called to do that. Another way, we do a lot of spiritual warfare and we just notice that it works. Whenever we do that and we really discipline ourselves to do it in our state, we, we see changes. So that's one of our little things we do as well. Um, you've, there's a couple of questions here about the worldwide protests, the protests for Australia this Saturday. Do you think they'll do any good? Um, no. you, you, yeah, you, you answered that uh, earlier. Yeah. London have been getting incredible turnout and it's made zero difference. I mean, in London's phenomenal what they've been getting. Um, France have been getting huge turnouts because um, people forget numbers and statistics. Like people say it's incredible 
London had a million people. So I, I had a bit of a careful check. London's got about 9.5 million pe people population, plus people coming in from outside London. So in actual fact, it's only about 8 to 9% of the population, which is not actually all that much at all. So at the moment, protests are not working because the percentage of, of the numbers is very small. Now, uh, small numbers doesn't necessarily mean it won't work, but the kind of protests that have worked is Black Lives Matters. I mean, they may be small, but they're smaller, but they're radical. I mean, they'll go in there, they'll burn down buildings, they'll set themselves on fire, they'll go crazy and scare the crap out of people, so they just give them whatever they ask. <laughs> That's the kind of protests that work. Um, I had a couple of questions, Warren, about does a, having a no trespassing sign um, have the have validity at your you know, at your gate prevent anyone entering your property, for example, to coerce the jab? Or I didn't really go into that today. Um, there is a high court case, Plenty versus Dillon, which gave some strict limits when some police just stormed into someone's property, and the high court said that your home is your castle, and if you have got a certain trespass sign that you can do it. But yeah, plenty versus Dylan. There are some limits. Whether it works for compulsory jabs, I don't know. Um, my feeling is probably, but I don't know. In any event, I can't see them walking onto your property. But yeah, it may be worth, that may be an option worth exploring to, to, to do that for you know, people coming onto your property. Yeah. Um, oh, gee. <laughs> questions are flying in thick and fast i can't keep up um okay plan process we've done um we'll just find this just find the questions that are really valuable you think that will help yeah, yeah. rather than sort of crazy out there ones yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um are you aware of an affidavit of status and do you think this is a good tool to recognize our position in the order of creation I've heard about that. I, I, like I said, I think there's a lot of misinformation out to throw people off, and I personally think that's one of them. But I'm not saying that I'm right. I, I've rarely met anyone who's used them with much success. But that's not saying that they don't work. I just haven't come across them. I mean, I've looked into some things along that kind of line. I haven't really ever met anyone who's getting ongoing success with that, without a lot of problems in their life. Yeah. Um... Uh, isn't commercial law in effect, uniform commercial code? So is there an advantage to A, ensure you do not consent to conduct business or conditionally accept and B, file a UCC1 financial statement to separate uh, yourself from legal action? Yeah, that's getting into a very, that um, detailed kind of, um, yeah, I mean, that's, there is a, I mean, Howard Freeman was big on that. So if you search Howard Freeman UCC connection, he's probably the best in that area. And he got great success in America. I've never met anyone in Australia. Oh, yikes, I better go somewhere. Um, running out of battery. I don't think I've ever seen um, anyone um, in Australia using the UCC as well as Howard Freeman did in America. But yeah, Howard Freeman. But if you read Howard Freeman, he really had to push hard and go through numerous obstacles before he finally got his success. But yeah, the evidence I found is that the Uniform Commercial Code does definitely govern our thing and bring in martial law and override our common law to a degree, but that's getting into such complexities, it would confuse everyone. So if you want to go into that one more, look at Howard Freeman, he's the best. Yeah. Uh, Warren, I request again to mention the um, energetic clearings um, for each state, you know, as in that's an energetic march of freedom of sorts. If you wanted to mention those oh. again, that's a nice reminder. Yeah, yeah, no, someone's mentioned that. Yeah, look, no, we, on our City Awakening group, we're doing that. We've been seeing really good results in WA when we do it. And when I get out of habit of doing it, we suddenly get locked down. So like I said, I can't prove that it works, but so far there's been incredible consistency every time we're doing it, that things move out. And when we stop doing it, it stops happening. And we did Sydney last night and people were actually saying to us that um, they noticed there was at least... They were going into places where normally they were given a hard time with masks and they weren't being given them as much. So, like I said, it takes a little bit of small work, but that's just another avenue you can go. Yeah. Um, uh, someone's asked, what are your thoughts on claiming live birth certificates? Oh, I think it's silly, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, lots of thank yous coming in. Um, energy works more powerful, yes. Um, um, Anonymous attendee asks, if you think there was a socialism idea, would they be able to take away private property? Oh, look, that's a big one. That's why I'm teaching that. I think that people who are concerned about the jab right now, I think there's a bigger problem that people are missing because they're so worked up about that. I still reckon I don't think they're going to make it mandatory. I think the odds are heavily against that. I think there's a far bigger threat, and that's the, the Great Reset, because I think they're going, to, they're going to try and take everyone's money. And whenever you see civilization collapse and this kind of stuff, they start seizing people's properties. And all the books I've read and the study of the predictions that were coming for the society is they're just going to start taking people's money. They'll nationalise properties. I think you can even see the day where if something's not done, they'll just grab people's properties off them that's my, and nationalise everything. And we kind of already do that by changing the real whole of the titles and stuff like that. So I think the money concern is actually the biggest one of all myself. I think that's a really big risk. Mm. Um, another one quickly, Warren, is it possible to avoid quarantine using the Biosecurity Act? Oh God, I think Nathan Buckley would be able to answer that question better than me. Again, that sounds like one of those has to be tested in a court of law kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, Nathan's um, probably got an opinion. And I think um, AFL Lawyers is another one I've heard who they write this wonderful page about all this kind of stuff. So Shayla says about, I'm worried about the social credit and the microchip society. Oh, look, with good reason. I mean, you know, prophecy is not true unless it starts coming to pass. But so far, the book of Revelation, chapter 13, seems to be coming to pass full on in real life right now. So, yeah. Yep. Are there ways to structure asset ownership to buffer against property seizure? There are, yes. Yes. Um, Someone asked what rights we have under martial law. Um, yep. Only what the what our lovely commanders give us in their mandates. Yep. Yep. Do corporations, the corporate state police forces, have any power over the living? That is, if you do not identify yourself as the legal fiction of a person, but as a living human being, can police forces touch you? Oh, like I said, good luck trying it. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> I know people who've tried it, and they normally are the ones that you watch the videos and watch them take off in the jail. So as long as you're happy to go along with a 95% likelihood you're going to end up arrested and put in jail, Chris, yeah, give it a shot. Yep. Um, because of the great of the socialist great reset, can we pursue a lodial um, title on our property? And is it more is it more worthwhile to buy more gold and silver? Well, I can't give a legal. I can't give financial advice on the gold and silver. That's just one strategy to protect you in the crash, um, which is commonly used by the high net worth. Um, a lodial title, yes. Well, that would be lovely if we had that. But Australia, they've got three holes, so that's that's a whole. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I call one of those things that right now we have about 0.0001% chance of getting anywhere with that. But who knows, if we have a big enough awakening in Australia and people wake up to how it works, that may well end up happening where we go back to getting some, you know, pure allodial title, not freehold. Yeah, um, a couple of questions have come in about finding out more about um, how to structure for assets. You'll be doing more training on that in the future, Warren, won't you? Well, yeah. I mean, if people want to get a sneak preview on that, um, what I will say is um, I'll just quickly show you. Um, just keep in mind that um, we've got some free trainings on this Global Wealth Hub site, which is where we're educating for the Great Reset. Um, so this, there's, there's free trainings that people can watch, um, which goes through here. That's like a bit of a gift we give out. Um, there's quite a few videos in this area here. There's a few in here, one or two in there. Um, there is um, consults, but that's for people who are more interested to find out more about becoming, a, you know, a paid or committed member of the club um, and what we're doing. So I, as you can see here, this kind of um, gives you what you're looking for or whatever else. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's... There's some good trainings up here, so I recommend um, go and you know watch these trainings, so to speak. Yep. Um, is it AFL solicitors or AFL lawyers? I'm not sure, but um, I think it's AF, I, I think just type in Google, you'll find them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick question as well. My son, who studies in Canada, uh, well, that's 12 months away. Who knows what's going to happen between um, yeah. if he's coming oh, back yeah. next June? Yeah. That's a that's a long way away. Um, 
Uh, what about quantum grammar? Does this no part idea. serve? Yeah, I've never heard of that one. Never heard of it. Yeah. Um, I don't get into weird concepts. I don't, I've, I've looked into that for years. I even had friends who tried it, tried a few myself, got no of them. So I don't waste my time. I prefer stuff that I think is going to work. I'm not saying it won't work. I think the chances are that it won't. Yeah. Um, okay, and that's probably... Let's leave it at that. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be here yep. until um, Christmas Day and probably yeah. Santa will be coming down our chimneys. Yep. Um, yeah, and we have got a couple of other sessions coming up. So, um, you know, there'll be a chance for more questions and obviously more learnings when um, you take the stage again, Warren, this time next week. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you for your kind words. I'm getting plenty of kind words and thank you. I really appreciate your appreciation. It makes me happy and makes me think great. I appreciate it. So thank you, everyone. Lots of love and see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.